Hey, Marina, thank you so much for doing this interview with me today. I'm so excited to talk with you. Thanks for inviting. So what I want to talk to you about in this interview is basically how you learned English and then how you immigrated to the USA, started your company and everything that you're doing now, because I think all the information that you have and the stories you have are going to be really interesting to the subscribers I have here on this channel. So why don't you go ahead and get started by telling us where you're from? Okay, so I'm from St. Petersburg, Russia. I was born and raised there, and when I was 25, I moved to the United States. So English has been my passion since I was four years old, because my granddad would always tell me that, Marina, if you learn English, you can do anything, because you can be a singer in English, you can run a company. I was like, okay, I need to learn English. And he would always tease me. He would be like, okay, Marina, translate this phrase into English. And I'm like six years old, I barely speak Russian. <laughs> I'm like, I cannot do that. And he would laugh at me. So that was a big trigger for me. So I'm like, I'm going to study English. And I started when I was four. I was learning like dog and cat, of course, with my parents. And uh, I had a teacher. And then I went to a school that is like a normal school, but it has intensive English classes. And because I was so passionate about English, I was chosen as one of the winners to go to the UK when I was 14 to do like an exchange change program. And I went to a school where Kate Middleton studied, Smallbrook College, and it's a completely different experience uh, if you compare it to Russia. So in Russia, we had a school where I went in the morning and I left at like 2 p.m. It was like a really small building. That school, Smallbrook College, is like a whole city. <laughs> you have basketball fields, you have, I don't know, many buildings, you have halls, you have the whole church. And I fell in love with everything. But before I fell in love, I also realized I do not understand people. And it doesn't matter that I've been studying English for like 10 years by that time. I was like, I cannot understand British accent. I don't understand their jokes because they grew up in a different culture. And I felt a little depressed, but that was also a huge motivation for me to continue. So before leaving, I went to a bookstore. Uh, there was internet back then, but I didn't have it at home. So I bought a lot of books. I bought a lot of magazines. And uh, when I came back to Russia, I was just, you know, reading them from cover to cover. And I think like that trip was a trip that changed everything in my life. I realized first that I do not speak English the way I want to. I cannot really communicate with people. Second, I have really weird Russian accent. People don't get what I'm saying. Third, the world is so big and it's not just my city. It's actually a lot of places around the world where people have different uh, ideas, different goals in their lives. And I'm like, I want to connect my life with the whole world. I don't want to be just in Russia. I want to be everywhere. And yeah, and then the next summer, because I made friends with my host family, I called them next summer. I'm like, can I come and stay with you for three weeks? And surprisingly, they said yes. So the only thing I had to pay for was my ticket. But I also realized that those trips are the best way to learn a language. And then I had the same thing with my German. So when I was 18, I found a school myself. Uh, I went to Germany. I realized the whole process is really complicated. And this is when I got an idea to start LinguaTrip, which is a, my company. It's like a booking platform for language courses across the world. That's really interesting how your entire story and everything you experienced in life is ultimately what led you to create this company that you created. And everything you just said in like, what was it like one to two minutes was literally how many years of your life? Like over 20 years, right? Because oh, you started when you were four years old and now it's like, yeah. boom. And then I made my company and I'm just like, wow, like that's crazy. And I think when people hear it, maybe they don't understand everything that took place in between. Oh, sure. A lot you of know. things took place in between. Yeah. Like in your first trip, when you said you first went to the UK and all of a sudden you were confronted with this realization that, oh my gosh, I have been studying English for years, which is basically the story of almost everybody on my channel. They've been mm -hmm. studying English for years and then sometimes they go abroad or some of them haven't been abroad yet and they go, oh my gosh, this is nothing like what I expected. I don't understand locals and it's such a frustration for them. So how did you go from, I understand and comprehend English in my English English classes to then becoming a fluent speaker like how did you make that crossover how long did it take and what did you do to become fluent yeah it's a great question I think it took maybe two trips to the UK so the first trip it was just the realization of what's going on 
The second trip, I tried to interact as much as I could with everyone. I tried to understand the accent. I tried to work on my own accent because when you come somewhere like Starbucks or a cafe and you order something and somebody doesn't get you, they get frustrated and I didn't want that. So I tried to work on my accent as well. So I think, yeah, it, it took two trips. Sometimes it takes longer, but because I was 14, I think our brain is so flexible when we're young. So we're really open to new accents, new words. With German, it took a little longer though. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's actually something that I'm glad that you're bringing up because so many people have this idea in their mind like, oh, if I just go to the US and study for six months, I will magically like become fluent, like have the level of fluency that they've been dreaming of all their life. What do you think about that? Well, I think six months is a long period. So in my case, those two trips, they were like two or three week trips. Uh, two years in a row. Um, so in total, that's like a month and a half. Um, so I think half a year is great, but it also depends on what you're doing during those uh, six months. Sometimes you're just hanging out with people from your country or you're on Skype with your family all the time and you're speaking your own language. In my case, again, I was lucky that that time nothing exists that was Skype, but again, internet was a privilege. <laughs> that was 2004. So uh, I called my mom once a week. I didn't meet any Russians. Like there were no Russians in the place where I were. So I didn't speak Russian at all. And sometimes right now this is a problem because when we come somewhere, we have this thing and this thing is all in our language. There's Instagram with people's feed from, I don't know, in my case, it's Russia. There are people from my country. So when you are traveling somewhere, my advice number one would be to go to a smaller town. Um, for example, we're talking about the U.S., LA is a place where all of the tourists go. I would go to some, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale is one of my favorite places in Florida. Uh, it's not really international. It's mostly American town, but you get the seaside and you get a nice Florida climate. And then the second advice would be staying with a local family versus staying in the residence. Because when you're staying in the residence, you meet people from, again, your country. When you're staying with locals, you're just interacting with locals. Uh, I think so about staying with locals, though, because I have, let's say, businessmen that are on this channel learning mm -hmm. English and they're 40 years old and they have a family. Would they stay with locals, too? Or is that like for I, well, younger people? Sometimes they do. It depends. Again, if you are going to London, for example, we have different tiers of families. So you can stay in an executive homestay where you will have a separate bedroom with separate bathroom and they would cook for you. And this is a higher level accommodation. Um, sometimes you don't have this option. Like when you're going to a smaller town, we just have some families there. So it depends on the kind of personality. We had a 78 year old who went to the UK to study English. She stayed with a local family. She loved it. Again, it really depends on the personality, I guess. That's awesome because sometimes people comment and they say, oh, Stephanie, thank you for your videos, but I'm too old to really learn English. No, 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 you're never too old. When I was studying in Germany, I was studying mathematics and economics, but I took an Italian class as a, like a side class. And we had a guy who was 75 years old he was doing his bachelor's in art and he took italian as a side class as well i was amazed i was like i want to be like him <laughs> i'm 75 yeah actually i know someone who's around that age too and she studies english and she was telling me i don't know if this is true or not but according to her it's been scientifically proven that studying languages basically helps you retain your memory longer it's, yeah it's it's been proven yes because your brain stays flexible so the more you learn the more you train brain is actually a muscle so the more you train it the longer it stays active so the truth trips basically to the UK. You said you went to the UK twice, right? Yes, I went to the UK. I went later, later on when I started the company, I had a chance to go to Canada as well. I had a chance to go to the United States. But back then, my parents couldn't afford, you know, traveling so far. And so I was relying on those scholarships. So you feel like going to those trips to the UK is sort of where you became fluent or you just became more fluent and then over the years you've been improving? Like right now, do you feel like you're still working on your English and still oh, improving? Oh, I am. Every, every day, every single day. I'm learning new phrases. When I'm recording videos for my channel, I'm learning new idioms. I'm like, oh my God, that's what she meant when she said that because I didn't get it back then. But yeah, uh, I'm learning every day. But I think the biggest jump from like being intermediate, not really speaking English happened when I was in the UK. That was like the biggest progress that I've had. And then when I moved to the States, again, it's a completely different English. So 
Back then, I was just talking about studies, maybe uh, daily stuff. When I moved to the U.S., I had to raise money from venture capitalists who are here in the Silicon Valley. And I had to, you know, talk to lawyers, talk to accountants. And this is a completely different English. Yeah. Well, you know what? You had this huge goal. You're like, I want to start a company. And so you were using English as a tool. You weren't necessarily like every day in the grammar books, like, oh, I'm just studying English. I'm studying English. You're like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to lawyers. So you would probably Mm -hmm. research questions, like which questions should I ask them? How should I ask it? What should I say? Or if there was vocabulary you needed, you probably, you know, got that vocabulary on the go and Mm -hmm. then did your conversations or whatever it is. And you're just sort of interacting in daily life using English as a tool to reach this much bigger goal that you had. Um, and that's how you've been improving along the way every single day. And that's, that's the best thing to do, right? Because when you are motivated to get something, English like a side project, so you're reaching another goal, but then it's actually easier because when you concentrate in just English, you're like, oh, today I have to learn a hundred new words. Oh my God, that's so boring. But when you're like, okay, I need to get an O visa for the United States and tomorrow I have a call with a lawyer and if I don't ask this question, then maybe I don't get the visa. And then it's a completely different thing. Yeah, and you have a different motivation. Like you said, you were working on your pronunciation. So I don't know, maybe you were talking to yourself in front of the mirror or talking while you were driving. But it's not just, I want to work on my pronunciation. It's, I have an interview coming up. I have this coming up and I want people to understand me. Yeah, when we graduated from an accelerator here in Silicon Valley, I had a, a presentation. I was on the stage in front of 700 top investors here who invest in Uber, Facebook. And yeah, I had three minutes when I had to present my company. I had to be funny. I had to sound natural because I was presenting an English language company. <laughs> so that was tough. Yes, it was a lot of rehearsing, a lot of practicing. Um, but yeah, I think this is also when I improved a lot. Yeah. That's incredible. And you know what? When people study abroad and they speak English for the first time with other people, I think it gives them such validation. And that's what you knew because you experienced it. And so you went in front of these investors to present your company. So let's actually talk about that right now because I am beyond fascinated by you and by your story, by what you've accomplished. Because This to me, like, I guess I could say, even though you are constantly reaching new goals and constantly working towards whatever it is that you want to do, you're basically where so many people want to be. You've accomplished what so many people want to do. And I really, truly appreciate being able to bring you to this channel to show people what they can do, because I want non-native English speakers around the world to really know that they can use English to accomplish amazing, amazing things. You know, they're hard workers, they're smart people, and I just want them to know what's possible. So you were born in Russia, but you used English to create this dream that you had. So talk to us about your business. How did it start? How did you come up with this idea? Uh, Why was it so important to you? Thank you so much for kind words. (laughs) It's really... No, um, I could go on, but... (laughs) Thanks a lot. Yeah. So as I said, when I went to the UK, I realized that people are speaking a different kind of language, not what we learned at school. And then I had the same problem with German. So in my university, they told me, if you have an upper intermediate level of German, we can send you to Germany for half a year to study for free and you get a scholarship. I'm like, okay, I need to really pay attention to my German now. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go to a school that worked for me in English. So I will find a school in Germany. And I went to an agency because back then, like my UK trip was organized by the school, I thought maybe I should hire an agent. So I went to an agency and I'm asking him how much it's going to cost me to go to Germany for two weeks. And he's calculating the price and he said 1,300 euros. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot. I wouldn't be able, so my parents won't be able to afford it. But he gave me all the brochures and I came back home and I started Googling and I realized the school actually costs like 500 euros. Mm -hmm. And I realized that was the markup. So I booked everything myself. It took a while again because, you know, when you're emailing a school, they don't want to reply. They're really slow. But I figured it out. I bought my own tickets, bought um, booked accommodation. I love the experience. My level grew a lot. And then when I came back home, I talked to my classmates, the guy who was studying with me at the university. And I talked to him and said, well, the markup is like 700 euros and actually schools pay commissions. So we could work without any markup. But then we just had this idea in mind. And then my friend told me she wants to go to the UK and maybe I could find her a school. 
And we decided just to start a company because we had this first client. So we went to a, a registration office where they register companies in Russia. We only had $300. She was our first client. We made maybe like $200. Then we had our second client and then we rented a table in a co-working space. And I was sitting, at, so that was like a large, large room. I just had one table and the second thing that I had was a shelf and I could put a shelf by my table, but I intentionally put it in another corner of the room. So when the clients, clients came in, I stood up and went to the shelf and did made an impression that the whole office was ours because the average trip was like a thousand dollars and I couldn't just tell them, Hey, we're renting a table here. So that was a funny thing. Yeah. And then we just started. Um, so that was an office in St. Petersburg. And then we realized we wanted to be in Moscow, want to be in other cities, but I hated traveling, especially in winter because it's so cold. Um, and we realized this is not the way we want to grow. We want to go online and we want to grow all over the world and this is yeah how we came up with the idea of LinguaTrip that was 2013 so we started coding LinguaTrip but we were only able to deliver in 2015 because again we were really limited on budget the guys who engineer the coders were really expensive and then 2015 we started applying to different accelerators across the world again that's in short meanwhile also my co-founder so we were two when we started it he had to go and find another job because we were running out of money so he was working in an oil company in Russia, he borrowed money from his manager and his manager was telling him to stop because he said the idea was really stupid, like sending people abroad to study language. Yeah. Well, and that going to how, how's the company doing today? I think we talked the other day and you said you have how many people working for you guys? 43 now. 43 and 500 interns. <laughs> 43 and 500 interns. And you guys are sending thousands of people around the world to study in language schools, not just English, but if they want to study Spanish, if they want to study Italian, Italian in Italy, Spanish yeah. in Spain, German in Germany. I mean, that's phenomenal. And so how many countries do you guys, I don't know, send people to or schools? Oh, we have more than 400 schools. And yeah, I think 26 countries because there are top destinations like US, UK, Philippines mm -hmm. is a big destination right now, especially for Asia. But yeah, more than 400 schools. And how does this work? Like, let's say I want to study Italian in Italy. So I go to your website, linguatrip.com, and I can just mm -hmm. book it myself through everything exactly. that you guys have there. Yeah, Italian language, Italy, then you have all of the options, like in different cities, you can read the reviews of students. Some schools are located by the beach, so you can combine your vacation with studying. Some schools are in Milan or Rome, for example. So yeah, you decide where you want to go, and yeah, you read the reviews and you book a school. And is everything combined, like the accommodations, everything like that? Yeah, accommodation course, all of the registration fees charged by school. The only thing that is separate is the flight, because again, we don't know where you are. We have partners through whom you can book a flight. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. I imagine, though, that there are other ways of booking through a school directly, or you can book mm -hmm. through another company. But I think I saw on your website that you guys actually have reduced fees. You, you were able to negotiate with the schools mm -hmm. so that they give students who book through you a special discount, right? Yeah. So first it's a special discount. It's normally, it's, it depends on the school, but it's five to 30% off the published price. Because again, we have a high volume of students, so we're able to get individual pricing. And the second thing is that you get a free cancellation period. So what we're trying to create is like Expedia for booking hotels. We're trying to create Expedia for language schools. So we are giving students this freedom that I know sometimes plans change. And if you're booking directly through a school, they wouldn't allow you to cancel for free. They would charge some fees, but we have this period where you can just cancel for free. Wow. You know what? I want to ask you this question that's business related, but I almost think I know the answer. So you went from booking your own trip to booking your mm -hmm. friend's trip to starting mm -hmm. a, a renting a table and having a few clients to then going online and to now you have all these people working for you and you're worldwide. As a business, it's like, how do you go from that to that? You know, was there some manual that told you how to do all of this or did you just have to figure it out as you went along? You just figure it out when you work. So first, like our clients asked us, can I book from this country or that country? And we're like, oh, we need to translate our website. So when we realized we need to go online, that was the moment when I realized I don't like to travel. So instead of traveling, we can just go online and people would be able to book not from just like three or four cities where we have offices, but 
from all over Russia. And then when we translate it into English, we realize like anyone who speaks English can book on a platform. So I think it's all organic. We also have a vision where we're going. Uh, we don't have the exact like dates when we're like going online or this or that, but we have a vision that we are booking engine for those schools. See, so yeah, I think it's all really organic. You just yeah. feel it. It's like you, you have the idea and so you take a step. And when you encounter yeah. a problem, then you're like, okay, how do I solve this problem? You solve it, exactly. take another step, then you have another problem. And I guess that's just the nature of doing business. Yeah. And sometimes even clients call us and tell us, hey, why don't you do that? And we're like, of course, that's a great idea, especially when there are like hundreds of clients calling us with the same idea. So yeah, thank you guys for, for reaching out and advising us what to do. That's great. Awesome. And to wrap it up, do you have any advice for people who are trying to improve their English or who are thinking about maybe studying abroad? What do you have to say to these people? First, have a clear goal and maybe a due date when you, when you need to present your English. So for me, it's always like maybe it's a trip that I'm planning or maybe it's a, an exam I need to take. So have a really clear goal why you're doing that and what level do you need to reach your goal. Second, you also need to understand that if you want to do like master's degree or PhD or MBA, there is a lot of financial aid available, especially in the States. And I went through the story. This is like a different part of my life when I, when I tried to do an MBA and I was able to get into American schools with full financial aid. And I think really talented people across the world, they don't know about it because I didn't know about it. It was just by chance that I discovered this opportunity. So we'll go financial aid as well because not everyone in this world can afford an MBA that costs like $100,000. Yeah. So I think also- people, yeah, people are really surprised when they realize how much financial aid is available. I got over $5,000 per semester of financial aid in college, and it was simply because I looked for it. You know, there mm-hmm. were other people exactly. in my situation that could have gotten that money. It's available. There are donors. There are literally people that, you know, donate $200 for this scholarship, 300 for that scholarship. And if you just look for them and apply for each one, it's a little bit time consuming, but hey, free money. So exactly. That's but awesome advice English for that. You need to, you need to be able to write a personal statement where you talk about how important this education is for you. You need to be able to pass TOEFL or IELTS and score whatever they're looking for in that university. So English is very important in this process. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much, Marina. And for everybody that watched this video, you guys, please go subscribe on her channel because this, what you saw here was a little taste of what she (laughs) offers. I watch her videos all the time. I watch them religiously. And (laughs) you talk about how you got your visa, how you started your company, how you improved your English, goal setting, I don't know, productivity hacks. You talk about all of this stuff and more. So thank you for providing such a great resource for everyone. And please keep doing what you're doing because I think you're creating something really awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. No problem. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye.